And again, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we are looking now at an idea called flourishing ministry. We've been talking about the flourishing life, and I'll unpack that here uh, in just a moment. Uh, we went through flourishing worship. We studied Hannah's life over the last four or five weeks, and Hannah was a woman who was in pain, and there was brokenness, and she turned to the Lord, and she worshiped, and God did something that only He could do, and He gave her a son, Samuel, who will be the last judge before Israel gets king, gets a king uh, in King Saul. We're going to be done with Hannah's story and pick up now dealing with Eli and his sons in chapter 2. But this past Friday, I did the memorial service of, uh, of Tommy Lai. Tommy is, was the stepfather of uh, Mark Wong and his sister Wanda Wong. Many of you know Mark and Joyce and Jerry and Wanda here at our Cross Point campus. And Tommy was 95 years of age. He immigrated to the United States at nine years of age with his father. That's how a lot of the Chinese immigrants initially came with a father only or the father bringing one of his sons. He didn't meet his younger brother because he left Canton, China, uh, and, and when he was a, a young boy, he didn't, and his mom was pregnant with his younger brother. He didn't meet his younger brother until he was 16 years of age. So he grew up in Virginia, moved here when he was nine, and grew up in Virginia and experienced some discrimination and challenging circumstances. But Tommy was a, an overcomer. He made something really remarkable of his life. Uh, he, he served in World War II, served our country there as a uh, uh, radio operator. Then he moved to Houston in 1951. And when he came to Houston, he was trying to figure out, he was actually looking at going west ahead, uh, looking for a job, and he decided to stop in and see his sister, and he never left, right? Sometimes you think you're going one place and you find yourself in another. Tommy never left, and connected with the Chinese Baptist Chapel that had been a church plant of Houston's first Baptist church in downtown Houston, met the Lord Jesus there, and having met the Lord Jesus there, joined that church and committed his life to serving that church and served them as a deacon for 60 years. He married Lily Wu. They had two kids. And after 39 years of marriage, Lily died um, uh, from... Uh, a result of cancer. Uh, and so Tommy, as you know, grieved that. Um, Mark Wong, Mark and Wanda's mom, Mabel, also lost her husband uh, around the same time. God brought their paths together. And in 1994, a month after Mark and Joyce married, Mabel and Tommy married. And they were married for 27, 28 years until he died just a few weeks ago. Tommy was a creator. He was an innovator. He was a small business owner. This guy was amazing. Served our church for 10 years as a deacon. Served on our executive council. And as I said at the memorial service, in the boardroom, we'd be talking through some things. He'd say, Pastor, let's go. Keep going. Let's not, let's not let up. Let's keep reaching people. Let's keep sharing the gospel. That was his heart. A remarkable man who at 95 years of age had over 300 people gathered at his funeral. Now, I do a lot of those. It's part of what we do as pastors. We, do, uh, we walk families and, and, and folks through these final moments, final breaths, and then final ways to honor them. Had the privilege of being with Tommy as the Lord took him home. At the end of that memorial service, I looked at Mark, and I went over, we were talking in the lobby, and I said, Mark, this is remarkable. I said, very few memorial services, funerals have over 300 people at it. It's just, if it's a young person, a child, maybe a median adult, they might have a really big gathering, but 95-year-olds? I'm like, Tommy was an outlier. This guy's in the top 1%. Here's why I know that. 95-year-olds outlive all their friends. And so they're, 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 I'll do one this coming Saturday, but 94-year-old woman, Dottie McDonald, what a sweet servant. And so I told Mark, and I told his family, I said, Tommy's an outlier. This is amazing. I mean, like he's in the top 1% here. And what it tells me is that he had friends of all ages. He lived a life of influence, service, and faithfulness. Did you know God has a plan for your life? Over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about God's plan for your life. He has uniquely made you, crafted you, gifted you. He's got a great plan for your life. It is so cool to access God's plan. 
And he has a unique plan for every single one of us because you are uniquely made in his image and he has seen fit to make you uh, so wonderfully. But he also has a plan, the same plan for each of our lives. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Whether uh, you're white or black, you're Asian, uh, Indian American, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your socioeconomic status no matter what your age is, this message applies to every single one of us knowing and doing the will of God. You see, here's God's plan for your life. You ready? God's plan for your life is three things. Number one, to know him, to influence others for good, and to be faithful to the end. None of you can argue with that. That is God's plan for your life, to know him, number one. Number two, to influence others for good. And number three, to be faithful to the end. And we're going to pick up in the story in 1 Samuel. And what we're going to see is we're going to see brokenness in these three areas. We're going to see characters who don't know the Lord. We're going to see influence that is not used for good, but is for bad. And we're going to see a lack of faithfulness to the end. And what we launched this series talking about is your brokenness will keep you from flourishing. So let's unpack this outline as we unpack 1 Samuel chapter 2. And let's see what we can grasp and know and understand for our walk with our Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11 and following. It says, Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. That's Samuel. Now, the sons of Eli, verse 12, were worthless. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servants would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into a pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first, then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. So there's a goon squad here. That's, you know, get that, right? Then it says, thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Now, again, as we stepped into this idea of what is a flourishing life, we started with Uh, John chapter 10, verse 10. Because what we're going to see is that there are two core influencers in this world. There are two competing influencers in this world. Y'all know what influencers are, right? We have these influencers on these certain different kind of influence here. But notice what the scripture says in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Two influencers here. There's a thief, and he has a plan for your life. The thief has a plan for your life, whether you know it or not. That core influencer, who is the prince of this world, Satan himself, has a plan for your life. He wants to steal from you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. That is his plan for your life. Here's the bottom line. He hates you. He despises your success. He wants to ruin your family. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to turn, wants to get you to turn your back on God. He wants to bring such ruin and devastation into your life that you will say following Jesus is not worth it. That is his plan for your life. And that's how he wants to influence you. Then we have this second influencing force, the Lord Jesus himself, the good shepherd. The good shepherd of Psalm 23 who makes you lie down in green pastures and leads you beside the still water, who restores your soul, who guides you in righteous paths, who takes you through the valley of the shadow of death, who, who, who death, who uh, uh, anoints your head with oil, who puts a table before you, whose goodness and faithfulness and mercy is with you every single day. And then it gets even better. You'll dwell in this house, that good shepherd. And his desire is not just then, but now to bring you an abundant life, a life in which you will flourish. He doesn't come to steal from you, kill from you, destroy you. He loves you and he leads you. Y'all with me? Anybody say amen to that? I'm just checking because y'all are kind of asleep. It's 11 something in the morning. If you're still not with me, come on, let's go get some more coffee. We'll bring it in and serve it to you because I mean, I want you with me here. 
Okay? This is good. This is good news, right? And so we see, we see this plan that Jesus has for our life, and we see this plan that Satan has for our life. Now, as we open the pages of 1 Samuel chapter 2, what do we see? We see the influencer Satan is having his way with the high priest's sons, Phineas and Ferb. No, I'm sorry. You Disney fans will get that one. Phineas and Hophni. I just got a little distracted there. And notice what it says of them in verse 12 of 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Now, let me help you understand all that's happening here. Eli is the high priest. He is the intermediary for the nation of Israel. This is the time, wrapping up the time of the judges. Samuel will be the one as the people will cry out for a king. You're going to understand as we unpack this portion why they don't trust the priesthood and they want a king to rule over them like the other nations. And Samuel's going to be that transition, final prophet, priest, and king, who's then going to establish a a, a king uh, for the people. But he or prophet, priest, and judge. And, and, and at this point, Eli is the high priest. And he has three jobs. Oversee all the sacrifice. Oversee the Levites. The Levites, you have the, the sons of Aaron, who are the priests. And then the Levites, they're all of the house of Levi, of, of, of Israel's 12 sons. Levi, and of Levi, the house of Aaron. Aaron was the priest. Then the Levites who oversee all of the uh, tabernacle. The, the Levites who are living in different cities act as judges and teachers and, and interpret the law in those cities. And the Levites in particular don't have a, 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 an inheritance. They don't have land. The land is divided between the other 11 tribes and the Levites are to live off the offerings of the people. Eli's job as high priest is to make sure, one, the sacrifices are working, two, the tabernacle is working, the Levites are working throughout the land, and three, that there's good judgment taking place. And so he has certain Levites who are acting as judges. I mean, as you read this story, what you see is three, uh, he's only doing one of his three jobs. He is sitting on a stool at the tabernacle of the Lord judging. Sacrificial system, he's delegated. The way things are running in the house of the Lord, he has delegated. So it's important for us to understand that he's a man of great responsibility and influence, and he has a massive job. He was God's man, this descendant of Aaron, responsible for the spiritual and governmental influence of the nation. All of that was seated in his role. But here's a principle I want us to grab hold of as we talk, and it's called the principle of delegation. The principle of delegation is this. Though you can delegate authority, this is not free of responsibility. See, when I, when I look at you and I look out across this room of hundreds of people, here's what I see. I see leaders. I see influencers. You say, well, I'm not an influencer. No, you are. You have children, you're an influencer. You have grandchildren, you're an influencer. You have a neighbor, you're an influencer. You work for somebody, you're an influencer. You have clients, you're an influencer. You have kids in the classroom, you're an influencer. You're a pilot, you've got a lot of influence, whether you know it or not. I hope you know it, right? You commercial pilots, we really want you to understand. (laughs) You have great influence when we step on those planes. You're an influencer. And many of us will find ourselves in positions of authority, and here's what happens. When we give away, we delegate, and yet we also think we can give away responsibility, we've missed a step. Eli has delegated. And in his delegation, he has also given away his responsibility. Uh, Barry Landrum, who I used to work for, was our pastor for many years. He says, don't expect what you don't inspect. Roger, don't expect what you don't inspect. He'd tell that to our staff all the time. Don't expect what you don't inspect. Go put your eyes on it. You're still accountable for it. And he's saying to me, Roger, I'm still accountable for it through here through you. Don't expect what you don't inspect. And Eli has delegated this vast responsibility to his sons, but the problem is that the base requirement for them to fulfill their God-ordained roles is not even present. They don't know the Lord. They don't know the Lord. Some of you are here today and you're looking for a life hack. 
You're like, man, I want to overcome my anxiety and I, I, I want to flourish. I want to this, I want to that. And you've been, you, you show up, you're faithful, you come and you come in and, you, and, you're, and you're, you're hanging out with the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, but you don't know him yet. And for whatever reason, you've refused to give him your heart. Baseline, bottom line, first step of the walk with Jesus is to humble yourself and take a knee and to take Christ as your Savior. That's where it begins. That you open your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. That you admit you're a sinner in need of a Savior. That you believe Jesus is God's Son, that He died for you and He rose again. That you confess with your lips, Jesus is Lord. Because here's the deal. God's not going to change His plan because you want Him to change the rules for you. You can come around and hang out around the people of Jesus and hear the stories of Jesus and maybe get a life hack or two that'll make your life better. But if you don't know the Lord, friend, you're lost. And you will spend an eternity separated from God. Oh, pastor, don't talk about hell. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. That's my job. May make you mad, but listen, it's true. God is holy and he demands that we would be redeemed because in our own good deeds, we cannot meet his righteous standard. And so what he did, what he did in his love is he gave us Jesus who died for us, who stood in our place, who took on the wrath of God for our sin that we might be united with him. God is love and he loves us and he gave us his son. And so will you submit your heart unto the Lord Jesus Christ? It is the first step. And every person that walks through these doors that watches us online, our heart for you is to take this step to know the Lord. So at the end of this service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray a prayer, asking Jesus to come into your life because this is where it begins. God's plan for your life is that you would know him. We see this in the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, verses 24 through 27. Make no mistake, following Jesus is not easy. Look at Matthew 16, 24 and following. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he's done. The call of Jesus is to deny yourself. It is to pick up the cross and follow him. It's not easy, folks. Jesus' heart for you is that you would know him. Look at how he prays for you and me in John 17, the night in which he's betrayed, right before he goes through the beating, the, 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 the false trials, and ultimately the cross. Listen to how he prays for you. John 17, verse 3, it says, and this is eternal life that they know you. He's speaking to the Father. He's praying to the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. God's will for your life, God's plan for your life is that you know the Son. That you know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his heart for you. That's his plan for you. So it begins, A, admit you're a sinner in need of a Savior. B, believe, believe Jesus is God's Son who died for you and rose again, conquering sin and death. And C, confess with your lips, Jesus is Lord. Now here's the deal. There's another aspect of God's plan for your life, and that is this, that you would influence others for good. And a lot of times we think the, the journey with God is just that. Well, I know Jesus, and we never move off of that first step. God has so much planned for your life. He's got so many steps he wants you to take to walk with him, to know him, to grow in him. And we just say, well, I, just, I know Jesus, that's enough, right? Well, that's, yeah, it's the starting point. You got to start there to know him, but you know what? He wants you to influence others for good. That's his plan for you. And what we see in this text is that these priests who are around the house of the Lord all the time don't know him, and therefore they don't influence for good. They influence negatively. See what's happening in verses 13 uh, through 17. We have Hophni and Phinehas who were abusing the people with their positions. Right? So when the people were offering sacrifices, they're coming. And in particular, when we saw uh, uh, Elkanah and Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, they were bringing a peace offering. And when they brought the peace offering, they would bring an animal, and the law prescribed that the priest would get the right shoulder and the breast. 
The fat would be burned to the Lord. The priest would receive the right shoulder and the breast. Remember, the priest lived off the offerings of the people. And then much of that would be given back to the family and they would have a feast before the Lord. And that's why Elkanah is handing out portions to each of his family members. That was chapter one. So here later on in the story, uh, Hophni and Phinehas have created a custom and it's a very disruptive custom. They are not following the law. Now, if you think of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's the Pentateuch. That's the law written by Moses, authored by God, chronicled by Moses, and it has policies and procedures, rules and regulations. The book Leviticus are the policies and procedures the Levites were to follow. Leviticus, it makes sense, right? Levites have to follow these rules and policies and procedures. I'm not a big policy and procedure guy myself. Like, I'm like, oh, weigh me down. Well, man, you read Leviticus. Guys like me, we read Leviticus. We're like, oh, you who write policy and procedure, you're like, give me Leviticus, you know? Leviticus, notice the rules and policies and procedures. It gives us context to understand this story. Leviticus 3, verse 16, And the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering with a pleasing aroma, all fat, is the Lord's. Leviticus 7, 23 through 25, speak to the people of Israel saying, you shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat. The fat of an animal that dies of itself and the fat of one that is torn by beasts may be put to any other use, but on no account shall you eat it. For every person who eats of the fat of an animal of which a food offering may be made to the Lord shall be cut off from his people. Okay, so this is the law, right? Don't eat the fat. It's the Lord's. And if you do, you're going to be cut off from the people. Now, we got a problem here, right? The very priests who are offering the sacrifices are like, give me the fat, give me the fat, give me the fat, I want the fat. Now, some people like the fat cracklings, you know what I'm saying, in, the, in their marbled steaks, and some are like, oh, I don't want it. We have three in our house who don't like it. We have two in our house who love it. Three over, two, a couple of them over here who don't like it. So Coop and I, when I prepare steaks, man, we'll take that fat and we'll just, and then we'll just have a moment out on the grill. That stuff, that's, uh, mm, and we're just, ah, we're just eating the fat. I mean, it's tasty. You know, hey, I'm New Testament believer. You know, it's all good. That's what, that's what, that's, you know, you know, you can have the fat. You know, okay, so read in the book of Acts. So, but anyway, um, the fat portions belong to the Lord. And they were, they were to be burned as a sacrifice. The right shoulder and the breast belonged to the priest. That was well known. And so you have this interaction. Now look at verses 13 through 17 again. Notice how they develop a custom. You might want to circle the word custom because it's showing you they're departing from the word of God. The custom of the priest with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Now, wait a second. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I'm almost done. The right shoulder and the breast belong to the priest. The fat belong to the Lord. The right shoulder and the breast belong to the, the priest. Now, what's the procedure? What's the custom? They bring this big three-pronged fork and they stick it in there. Don't you know they, they did a competition to find out who was the best guy who could come in. And they get it and whatever they got out, they kept. You see how the very people who are to guard the law of God and to lead the people and influence them for good have hijacked the whole process. Keep reading. This is what all that they did at Shiloh. And then here's what it says. To all the Israelites who came there, moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first, right? What's that? It's about Leviticus 3, Leviticus 7. Let them burn the, fat, burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish. He would say, no, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it from you by force. Do you see the abuse, the pain? Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. These guys have created a custom. They have so moved, right? Here's the thing, guys. Listen to me. Listen to me. When you're, when you're looking for a church, when you go off to college and you look for a church, go to a church that preaches the word of God and hold fast to the word of God. Because when the leaders of churches 
And I was in Boston not too long ago, and the places we saw gay pride flags was in the churches. It was nowhere else in the city, but it was in the windows of the churches. I'm like, oh. When the leaders of the church step away from the word of God, I'm like, oh, that wasn't too bad. And they develop these customs, and they flow with the culture, and they find a way to justify it. Well, you know, we as Levites, we don't get our own lands. We don't get our own stuff, and so we're just going to take some of it. We're going to make it our own. It brings ruin and devastation and hurt and pain. God's plan for them was to fulfill the role he had established for them, was to know him and to influence the people for good because this is the way in which they connected with God. And the very place where they were to connect with God, the very place they were to get to know God better was becoming a mockery and there was so much pain. Thus, verse 17, the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. See, these men are given a position of influence. They don't respect or regard those in authority over them. They don't respect their father, Eli. Just keep reading the story, you see that. They don't respect the, the, the scripture, the, the, the policy and procedure by which they are to, to walk. And they don't ex- respect the greater authority of God himself. Thus, the offering was contemptible. Thus, the people that offered those offerings, they held in contempt as well. This is a classic case of abuse of leadership. And it's also insubordination at its finest. Now, if you're a leader and you've got people who serve alongside you and underneath you, I want to talk to you about insubordination for just a moment. This will be for free. I'm not charging you anything extra for this. When you see insubordination, you got to deal with it. You got to deal with it. You got to do it, and you got to do it quickly. Here's why. See, you have a couple of options. One, you confront the attitude. Number two, you correct the, act, the actions. Or number three, you change the leader. You've got to confront the attitude. You teachers who have these children in your classroom, you know this better than any of us. You're like, no, if I'm going to lead 30 kids every day, all day, Michelle, you know what I'm talking about? All day, every day, I got to deal with it. You know, uh, 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 uh. Mm, we're not going to do that. No. No, here's what we are going to do. We, can, we confront the attitude. We correct the action. But again, if it's something you've delegated to somebody, then you've got to change the leader. If they don't change course, you've got to change out the leader. If you find yourself being changed out as a leader, it might be because you're committing the sin of insubordination. You're rebelling against the authority God placed over your life. Well, they're not a godly authority. Go ask Joseph if he had godly authorities over his life. God has placed authority over your life for your cultivation. The minute you start to get on board with that is when God starts to work in your life again. But the longer you kick and resist and you push and you, 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 know, you kind of kick and scream, that's going to be where God's like, look, I'm trying to get you to yield. I'm trying to get you to let the culture there break you. I'm trying to get you to be useful. And to be useful, we've got to submit to authority God's placed over us. Or we've got to go somewhere else ourselves. Okay, that was for free. Notice 1 Samuel 2, 22 and 25 through 25. Notice why... It wasn't corrected. Notice this real quick and I'll be done. Now, Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. This looked like Baalism, not worship of Yahweh. And he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good. It's a no good report that I hear from the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against the man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father. But it was the will of the Lord to put him, for the Lord to put them to death. Notice the word kept in verse 22. Eli kept hearing. First time you hear it, Eli, there's something you're supposed to do, right? You got to go deal with it. But he wouldn't. And so his influence waned. And what we see is going to happen is that he is not going to uh, fulfill God's plan for his life of faithfulness to the end. Notice this. Why this happens is because we stop knowing the condition of our flocks. Proverbs 27, 23 and 24 says, Know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds. For riches do not last forever. And does a crown endure to all generations? Eli had a crown. It was the, the high priesthood was to pass from one generation to the next to the next to serve faithfully before the Lord. And God says, enough, I'm done. I'm going a new direction. 
And so a man of God comes and speaks to Eli. You can read the rest of the chapter. And he says, God's going to take the lives of your sons. He's done with them. And if there's anyone left in your household, they're going to be left begging for bread because you have fattened yourself on the offering of the Lord. Literally. Eli is an obese man. All he can do is sit and judge because he bought in to their scheme. Notice this. 1 Samuel 2, verse 29. Why then, this is the core accusation, do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people, Israel? Why do you honor your children more than you honor me when you take them on Sunday mornings to play on the grounds of soccer fields and volleyball courts and baseball fields and football fields? Why do you honor your children more than you honor me. That's the accusation God would make to our churches. Why, believers in Jesus, do you not tell the world, no, we're not showing up. We'll be there at about 1245 when the pastor finally finishes. (laughs) Y'all with me on that? Y'all know? Jim, you know. We're not going. We're not coming. And if enough believers would say, no, we're going to honor the Lord. When you stop honoring the Lord in your own household because your kids want to play sports, listen, you have taken a wrong turn. I just made a much of you mad. I get it. You're not always going to agree with everything I say, but that's right out of the word of God. But dad, I want to play. Yeah, you'll play about one o'clock when we get there. But dad, I want to, uh, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, I'm thinking about your influence long-term. I'm thinking about your children's influence long-term. I'm thinking about the need in our culture to not be a weak church, to be a strong church, to be salt and light, to go, you know what, every Sunday we're gathering so we can, we can be fueled up, so we can go out again. Yeah, but man, my kids are going to get a scholarship. No, they're really not. I'm just, and if they do, praise God. Maybe, maybe faith says, you know what, it'd be great if they got a scholarship, but they're going to know Jesus first. Because at some point, their athletic career will end. I pray they know Lord, the Lord and walk with him. It's one thing when you release your children out from under your household and your biggest prayer is, Lord, may they walk with you. Your job right now is to teach them to walk with him by saying, come with me, follow me as we follow Jesus. Sorry, but I'm not sorry. I love you enough to tell you that. It is so vital that we launch our children out knowing and loving and following Jesus. So lastly, here's the deal. God's plan for your life is to be faithful to the end. I'm going to get there, I promise. We are wrapping up Tommy's service. Roy Harper's sitting on a front pew, and just for 10 minutes, people are walking by as I'm shaking hands. And Roy and I, we wanted to talk to each other, and so he just waited patiently. And as I went over, after 10 minutes, people going out into our welcome center, we shake hands. He goes, Roger, you know it's true, isn't it? So what is that, Roy? He goes, you die like you live. I'm like, wow. You die like you live. Tommy was faithful to the end. Here's what it says in 1 Samuel 2.35, and I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. You want to circle the word? Circle that word. I will raise up myself a faithful priest. A faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he will go in and out before my anointed forever. God's heart for you, God's plan for your life is that you know him, you influence others for good. And guess what? You would be faithful to the end. What does that look like in your marriage? Till death do us part. What does that look like with your children? In relationship with them and their children and their children to the end whatever the number of days God gives me. What does it look like in business that you've done it with integrity, that you've done it the way of God? What does that look like in the classroom? Is that man, at the end of every year, fist bumping your kids because you love them as Jesus loves you, that you are being faithful to the end. We want to hear Jesus say, well done, my good, and what? Faithful servant. That's the game. That's the end goal. That's the target. Faithfulness is the target. And so how do we hit that goal? I'm so glad you asked. Real quick, I got to have your email address. 
Because over the next few weeks, we're going to be dripping things to you. If you do not get a bunch of emails from us right now, I don't have your email address. So number one, go to our connection card, either in the pew back in front of you or online, and give us your email. Now, if you're going to write it, make sure it's like legible, please, right? It's a real problem. If it's not, we want to give you uh, tools to equip you. Because here's the thing. If you're going to be faithful to the end, you know what's got to happen? You know what's got to be present in your life? Real quick, last thing, last thing. Service, that you serve. You serve. You got to serve, right? Faithfulness is cultivated by serving, by serving others. So we need your email address. Follow us on social media, right? There are courses on our website. Just flow through those, Keith, if you would. Is it Keith back there? Yeah. Uh, we got stuff for you in this. November 6th, we're going to have a ministry fair. We want you to get your gifts in the game. You come and serve. Get your gifts in the game. Something happened to y'all in COVID. You're like, oh, I, just, I just don't want to serve anymore. I like just sitting back. It's kind of nice. It has never been harder for this church team to gather volunteers. COVID's over, y'all. I mean, they're still out there, right? Oh, Pat, no, please don't. Yeah, I know it's still out there. But it's time to step up. It's time to go. It's time to commit. It's time to re-engage. It's time to serve. We like, we like having the same 12 people do everything. No, we don't. Because <laughs> they're going to quit someday, you know? Because we need to spread out the love. All right? Does it make sense? So we're going to have a ministry fair. Here's what Jesus says to us. Matthew 5 is this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its taste, how shall it be salty? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out. This is Eli. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The way in which you'll cultivate faithfulness is by systematically serving day in and day out people in your house, people on your street, people at your church, people you encounter. Become servants. We're going to help you do that. Let's pray. Friend, if you don't know Jesus and you want to invite him into your life right now, it's a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I believe you died for me and rose again. I confess my need for you. Come into my life and save me today. Man, if you've made that decision, we want to know it. Go online to cityrise.org slash connect and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Tell us on your way out today. I prayed that prayer. We want to help you grow in your faith to what it is to be an influencer, to influence others for good, that you might be faithful to the end. Lord, that's our heart. Strengthen our service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, you stand. Let's worship Jesus.